everyone, welcome back. <sighs> Sorry. Why is this froze? All you got to do is ask, why are you froze? And it unfreezes. Or your computer's garbage. Yeah, could be either one. Okay, so we're going to get into part two of how Islam saved Western civilization. That's something in my eye now. So. Okay, let's get into this. This is going to be a 15 minute video. I mean, if it wants to play, it can. I'm not demanding. We can sit here and talk. No. Okay. Wi-Fi has to catch up. Sorry. Or it's an ad. It's an ad. Of course it is. Okay. Well, can we play the ad so we can skip it? What is the real story of January 6th? Come on, seriously. Okay, now we can start the video. Now, obviously European civilization is amazing. I mean, I'm after all speaking a European language in North America. You don't get here and conquer two whole continents with at least not having a really strong propensity to violence. You know what I mean? There has to be something there. It didn't just happen. <clears throat> I'm I'm zero percent Native American. Twenty three and me broke my heart. I was really hoping I'd be like I could have my little dances with wolves fantasy. Just no. So you know, here we are. Shame. Um, <clears throat> One thing that drives me crazy is when like that, like shame. On what? You had nothing to do with it. And it's not like the natives being killed here didn't happen to other people throughout history. You know, the, no country today is from that group that originally started it. Like, it's not started it, but that it was in that area. That's just, that's how we are, people, as a civilization. That's just what's happened. It is what it is. So there's nothing to be ashamed of. You had nothing to do. With it. If you were responsible for it, yeah, then you're a terrible person. But you didn't have anything to do with it. And if your your father did or your grandfather, that's not you. So. So there, it's not to reject that there doesn't need to be a story about Europe. It's to wonder about the question. Wait a minute. You started in Sumer now. I wouldn't have started in Sumer for a different reason. I'm a political scientist, I'm not a historian. Historians start in Sumer because 5,400 years ago is when they mostly agree, there's a little bit of disagreement, that that's when writing started. What a historian is, they're different from a political scientist. A historian believes that civilization starts with writing because a historian is a literary critic who does nonfiction. The difference between a historian and an English major is English majors do fiction, historians do nonfiction. So if there isn't something written, there's nothing for historians to talk about. I, on the other hand, don't care about that. The only thing I care about is politics. So I think government starts, uh, I think government starts civilization, not writing. In fact, <clears throat> why did writing? That's actually kind of interesting. History starts when there's writing. Well, no, but that's as far back as you could go. What am I listening to? Hey, stop. Okay. Happen in the first place. 
what happened was bureaucrats were trying to figure out how to keep track of how many cows they had, how much wheat they had stored in the granaries, how many swords they had, how many horses they had. And they went, the politician class went to the bureaucrats and said, you need to come up with some mechanism to keep track of all of this. And so the bureaucrats began coming up with symbol sets for numbers and for items. And over time, those symbol sets evolved into writing. In other words, government had to come first. <clears throat> the year is 6,264, according to the ancient Egyptian calendar. At some point, an ancient Egyptian politician said, you know what sucks? That the farmers don't know what day to plant their crop every year. If we made a calendar and kept track of when spring started, that would really make our lives easier. In other words, even the advent of the calendar isn't the start of civilization. There was a government before that. <clears throat> By the way, just for the record, the Egyptian calendar doesn't have leap years in it, so it's off by 0 0.24 years. It's actually 0 0.239, I think. So in other words, you need to do a leap year every four years, but every 100 years, you need to skip leap year but every thousand years, you need to go ahead and do the leap year you would have normally skipped. So in the year 2000, we were supposed to skip that leap year, but we weren't because it was the thousand year point. So that was the, that's why we went ahead and did it anyway. Really complicated, but a lot of fun. <clears throat> the ancient Egyptians, because they don't have that, their calendar is so old, they're off by four years. In other words, a way to think of it is the first day of spring has rotated through every single day of their calendar four times. So it's really the year 6,260, not 64. I'm bringing that up because what that meant then was farmers every four years had to actually move the date one day, right? Because the start of spring. And the Egyptians were like, people can keep track of that. Let's just move on. This calendar will be too too wonky and complicated otherwise. Egypt probably created government about 6,500 years ago. So civilization in Egypt is probably about 6,500 years old. We think that the Sumerians probably started government a couple of centuries later. So the Sumerians beat Egypt to writing, but the Egyptians beat the Sumerians to government, and the two of them were always really close to each other whenever there was a development. So it just kept Whoever was first, the other guy was second. Sumer and Egypt, they just kept flipping back and forth in developments. <clears throat> so another way to look at this is Egypt was conquered by the Romans in 31 BC. This is a pretty catastrophic event for Egypt at every level, in part because the Romans were rough. <clears throat> to give you an idea what I mean by the Romans were rough, when Gaius Julius Kaiser, the guy you incorrectly call Julius Caesar, uh, his first name was Gaius. His last name was Julius. His name that, con that modified his last name was Kaiser. Uh, uh, um, yeah, Gaius Julius Kaiser. Julius is his, his actual last name. What, what type of Julius was he? He was a Kaiser Julius. That, that's how his name actually worked. But anyway, so the guy that you guys incorrectly call Julius Caesar, um, when he conquered Gaul... Wasn't Caesar like the name of the the dictator or, or whatever. That, that was the name given, much like I would be Christopher President kind of thing. Like, what? Isn't that what, what Caesar was? The, the meaning was like uh, the, the control, the power. I'm not, it's not the definition, but do you understand what I'm saying? Today, France, he killed one million of the Celtic population living in Gaul. Now you go, how bad was that exactly? There were three million Gauls. He murdered one third of the population. He enslaved another million. And then he turned and looked at the remaining million and went, Welcome to the Roman Empire, oh, sorry, Republic. Because <laughs> they hadn't quite yet made it an empire, right? That, that was the Roman way. 
Now the Romans varied in how cruel they were. So when they got to Dacia, they killed and enslaved everybody. In fact, they were so thorough about destroying Dacia, you don't know where Dacia is. It's effectively been erased from history. I'll tell you where it is. It's Romania, as in the Romans erased it from existence and then named it after themselves. And it still holds the new name. When the Romans conquered Egypt, they wanted to crush the Egyptian population. So they did things like they banned Egyptians from owning land. They banned Egyptians from riding horses. They banned Egyptians from doing anything but wearing the color blue. Egyptians had to always wear blue. <clears throat> and the Romans did this because they knew that the Egyptian population was going to be complicated to rule over. And then they were right. The Egyptians kept rebelling, so the Romans kept massacring them by mass crucifixions. They were, Romans loved crucifixions, and they would just crucify yeah, they whole do. segments of the Egyptian population and then say, look, this is going to happen to you if you keep rebelling. And of course, the Egyptians just kept rebelling. So if we decide that Egyptian civilization stopped abruptly in 31 BC, I'm happy to do that for purposes of this conversation. I handle rebellion like this. I give everyone ice cream and I hope that they're lactose intolerant. Oh, they're gonna be farting up a storm. But you'll learn a valuable lesson. Don't rebel or your stomach's gonna hurt for a day or two. See, better than crucifixion, cleaner. And I make them clean up their own bowls and silverware, probably spoon. And if I gave them a cup, they have to wash that out too. So, you know, we all have different ways is what I'm saying. Then by the time it got to 31 BC, Egypt's civilization was 4,000 years old. Another way to think of this is when Alexander the Great conquered Egypt and went to the pyramids for the first time and gazed upon the pyramids. The Giza pyramids, which were not the oldest pyramids, right? The Saqqara pyramids are the oldest pyramids. The Giza pyramids are 200 years younger. The Giza pyramids were 2,300 years old for him. So when he was looking at the pyramids, he was going, I can't believe this is 23 centuries old. That's so insanely ancient. He was 23 centuries ago. He, we are as wow. far from Alexander the Great as the pyramids were from him. <clears throat> Just to give you a little sense of this. In other words, one lecture on Egypt seems probably inappropriate. One lecture on Mesopotamia probably seems like a little too much if you're admitting that's the founding of your civilization. That's a really strange thing. You can do this as an exercise. Try to figure out your favorite musical instruments, all of them, and then look at who invented them. About 85, 90. I'm a fan of the harmonica, which was invented by Ted Harmonica, I think, or I made it up. Percent of the musical instruments on the planet today were invented by the ancient Egyptians. So if you're into music, like how can you ignore that? The rest were invented by Persians. Although the Mesopotamians invented the bagpipe. Do you want me to say that again? Who invented the electric guitar? Hmm? Exactly. Was it the Egyptians? Maybe. Again, it wasn't the Celts. When the Celts were migrating through Mesopotamia, they heard the bagpipe and they went, oh, that is a nice sound. They grabbed it and took it across North Africa and then invaded Europe. One time I had a CD with bagpipe music. I plugged it into my car. I had an Irish friend, Connor, and he was in the car with me. And I said, listen to this. And he's, he's like, this is really strange bagpipe mu music. And I'm like, do you, like, does it feel like Ireland? He goes, yeah, a little bit. It was Tunisian bagpipe music because the Tunisians still play the bagpipe because it never went away. Right? So there are exceptions. <clears throat> but here's another way of thinking of this. 
the strangeness of the way the course is taught. It's the equivalent of doing this, having a course on English civilization. And then you're going to make it a 32 week course because you're going to have a part one and a part two. And of course, uh, English civilization, if you, if you take the moment that the Anglos and the, and the Utes and the Saxons are invading, invading Britain, we're talking about a 1400 year old civilization. The point where the Anglos take over is not 1100 years ago. So I don't know. Do you want to do the point where they invaded or the point where they conquered? At? Pick one, go with it. And then what you do is you cover the first part of English history all the way to 1776 in the first course. And then in the second course, you just actually, no, you wouldn't even cover it in the first, you would, you would do English history in the first course, like the first maybe two weeks. And then the rest of the course, you just talk about the United States. You just do 30 weeks of US history. And at the end, if somebody goes, wait a minute, I thought this was a course on English civilization, you go, we are England. We are English civilization. You would, well, I mean, yeah, we're a piece of English civilization gone rogue, but what about England? No, no, that's done. They don't do that anymore. They're not English. We're English. Do you see how weird this is? How could Western civilization have been born in Egypt and Iraq and then suddenly vanished after being there for thousands of years that you don't even deign to have a conversation about? When, when Julius Caesar is massacring the Gauls, <clears throat> Egypt is already 4,000 years old. Right? Egypt had a civil war that went 170 years. The United States is what, 240? 230-something, depending on, do you start it with the Declaration of Independence or the moment the Constitution went into effect? I don't, I've never figured out which one I want. One of those two is right. Right? I mean, Egypt has, has a sneeze that lasted almost as long as the United States has been around. <laughs> the U.S. Civil War was close to 170. I think we were at four. So if you do quick math, that would be 42 times, 42 plus times the, the amount. It's not a lot. So, so that's another weirdness about the conversation that we're going to have tonight is I, I need you to reframe the way you think about this. That this civilization that was birthed in the t banks of the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Nile can't possibly have stopped being there. But if you've been listening to the news lately, it gets really interesting because when Russia invaded Ukraine, all I hear now is Russia almost accepted Western culture. Russia almost accepted Western democracy. The West is supporting Ukraine. West, West, West. It's the old conversation from the Cold War, reborn again. So we got to go back a little bit here before the Cold War to understand some terminology. When the English were conquering the world, when the English were making the world England, they didn't finish, obviously. They didn't finish. They got 40% they done. And, and they ran out of steam. <clears throat> but 40% is amazing. Think about it, that tiny, itty bitty, teeny weeny little island where they boil their steak and fry their tomatoes, <laughs> where it's always <laughs> raining, somehow conquered 40% of the planet. That's why. You're eating boiled steak and it's always raining. You're just like, I just, you know what? If this keeps up, I'm going to get in a boat, I'm going to paddle, and the first land that I get to, I'm going to take a stick on the beach, whittle it down into a sword, and I'm going to kill someone. And everyone else is like, sounds good. I'm going to get on the boat with that guy. You want my boiled steak? Because him and I, we're going on a mission, and we're going to murder. I don't know how we're going to take driftwood and turn it into swords, but... You know, I mean, I like his idea so far. 
if it doesn't work out, I'll just kill him and then I'll boil him and eat him. <laughs> I still can't wrap my mind around it. They only ruled it for 200 years, but still, that's, I don't know, I don't even know what to make of that. That's talent. There was talent there. I'm not denying the talent. Just incredible talent, because a lot of it wasn't violence, right? The English would plant a flag. And the Indians are looking at it going, what is that? It's a flag. What does it do? It means we conquered you. And the Indians are like, oh, crap. You mean if we had gotten to your tiny little island and planted the Indian flag, we would have conquered you? And the English are like, yep, that's how this works. We, we got you. So there, there was a little bit of psych, psyching them out, right? That was also going on. <clears throat> so when the English had done this, they decided that they needed to make this idea of the East. There needed to be this concept of the East, the other, the, the nefarious, the sneaky, the mysterious, the strange. And so they came up with this idea of making the East being basically Asia and, and then going from there. Now, the Romans had this a little bit and the Greeks had this a little bit. So it wasn't that the English made it up completely from their own minds. For the, for the Greeks, it was the Persians. For the Romans, it was still the Persians. And so the English kind of had, oh yeah, this worked really well for the Greeks and the Romans. We want to have this for ourselves. So what they did was they named the far end of Asia, the Far East. They took the southern middle part of Asia, and they called it the Middle East. And then they took the western end of Asia and they called it the Near East because it was near Europe. I'm gonna end this here. We haven't gotten into anything Islam yet, but this has been fascinating. <laughs> I see why it's so long. Yeah, he really does have to explain a lot to get you to where he wants to take you. But when he's explaining it, it's it's fascinating. Well, I'm going to end this here. There supposedly is supposed to be a thanks button. You can donate to the channel if you'd like. If not, I get it. Times are hard. Don't worry about it. Um, but it's free to like and subscribe. So if you can give a thumbs up, that helps me almost as much as a donation would. So please do that. Subscribing helps as well. And last but not least, you have a good day. Have a good night.